Huh, after running the numbers, I really thought it'd be the black one. But you're black. Speaking of see-through, have you all seen Glastonian from legendary writer and director Rian Johnson? It's so dumb. <sighs> so dumb, it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb! I didn't like it. Ah, jeez, Rian. I did like Knives Out somewhat. Well, let me amend that. After a word from our video's sponsor. It was... Uh, uh, uh. I said only a word. I like the initial premise of Knives Out, so without spoiling the actual plot, it starts pretty classically. Rich old mystery author lives in a mansion, family comes up for his 85th birthday party, but it's quickly revealed he has very strained relations with all of them. So you have all these people, each with their own little reason to fuck him up, except his immigrant nurse, who jumped the border into his heart. But in a twist, dude dies an accidental death by his said nurse mixing up his medications. Surprise! It's not a murder mystery after all. It's this dumbass chick abetting her victim in his last moments to make it look like a suicide before this detective Eggy White catches the sin. What a fun little subversion, I thought. Truly what I could come to expect from the secret savior of Star Wars. Granted, Hugh, Hugh, this next part's my own fault, but I got it in mind, there'd be more than Knives Out. As I watched, I concocted this whole other double twist in my head that reframed everything. Like the author's death hadn't been an accident, but an actual suicide. To craft the perfect premise for a murder mystery novel in real life. Playing life like a game without consequence close a book with a flourish like the demented old man he was, his last exploit was to trick his good-natured nurse into thinking she killed him so he could supply her with a false alibi and have her cover the last of his tracks. After which, he had left her all of his inheritance to fuck with his family and the greatest mystery he'd ever conceived of for the super detective, Benoit Blanc, whom he anonymously hired beforehand. Unfortunately for me, that's not remotely what happens. What happened wasn't even what happened. The real subversion was a reversion. A subversion of the subversion. Who's subverting who at this point? I don't know. There's multiple Jewy. people inside of banks or in media. Whoa, whoa, calm your jet, Mr. Yeezy. I just got my monetization back. Yeah, so didn't really care for the rest of Knives Out. You may think differently. Despite that, I still hoped Rian would try something a little cleverer in Glass Onion. Not necessarily challenging the genre, but have some fun with it. It's so much stupider than that. Fool me twice. Shalom, ye. I'm Ye. What? Before I rant though, I want to establish an important narrative concept. You ever hear of the tragedy of Bay Leaf the Flies? I thought not. It's not a story your English teacher would tell you. So in the early 1900s, there was a famous Italian-American circus trapeze artist named Alfredo Bellucci, but better known by the moniker the Flying Bay Leaf, as he would wear a crown of bay laurels during his performances. Some Roman culture thing, I don't know. Specifically, he wore it because he could spin with such speed, the centripetal force would keep the laurel crown seated firmly on his head. Just unbelievably talented. He he was one of the best aerialists to ever live, and one of the first to be able to regularly incorporate an aerial triple somersault in his act. But one day, he got it into his head that he could go even further, with an aerial quadruple somersault, something no one had ever done yet. It's claimed he did actually achieve this in a safety harness during a practice session, but Bayleaf wanted to try it without, during an actual act. And so he did, against all of his peers cautioning, and at the peak of his jump, in the silence of a mesmerized crowd, it's claimed another Italian aerialist shouted, Hey, this Bayleaf! <laughs> Many circus goers gave their account afterwards, saying in the moment the Arios looked as if he was suspended in the air. Well, before what happened. Sad to say, it was the height of his career. Bayleaf plummeted head first, hit the net at an awkward angle, and was killed by a broken neck. A tragic cautionary tale. <laughs> Hence the name for our narrative concept, the suspension of Dis Bayleaf. The idea is that an audience will temporarily accept events and characters as real while knowing they're not, unless snapped out of it. It's a pretty cool phenomenon, where an audience is willing to go along with a fiction, no matter how fantastical or unreal, if the new reality is internally consistent, if the characters are convincing, if the plotting is without too many contrivances, and so on. But go too far, and the audience will come crashing back to reality. This is what I'll be focusing on. Glass Onion utterly failed to suspend my disbelief. And in a murder mystery, that's a skill issue, because I'll permit a lot of dumb shit. The premise itself is nothing too out of pocket. An eccentric tech billionaire, Miles Braun, invites a group of friends to his island for a weekend murder mystery game in which they'll solve his own murder. The friends are a group Miles calls the Disruptors. We have Bellhop doing Science Man. Lionel, you're something of a scientist. 
ditzy fashion designer lady and her long-suffering assistant, twitch Joe Rogan and his ladder-leaping girlfriend, and bought and paid for Democrat governor lady, but I repeat myself. Oh, and there's strong independent fax machine, Andy, with an I, but she's more of an actual disruption than a friend. Wow. Mmm. That was some real red pill stuff, Miles. I don't know, that tirade about never letting any member of, in his words, a certain international clique step foot on his island, it felt like a bit much to me. And somehow our country has been taken over by, you know, maybe about 300 Jewy. Zionists. No! The disruptors are all as goofy and one note as they sound, which is more than fine for this genre. It's practically a staple, though it is a problem when Rian spends the first 25 to 30 minutes setting these guys up. There's just no good reason to waste this much time on cardboard cutouts if you're not going to go beyond the caricature. We're trying to be as economic as possible in terms of the storytelling. Nevertheless, this is all stuff I can look past, even accept. But Rian just keeps stretching and stretching until shit's downright anorexic. So, rich guy invites his friends to an island no one can get to except in the morning because of the tide. Yeah, okay, not super uncommon in this genre. No workers, no security, no nothing, so everyone's in perfect isolation. Eh, it's a movie, so whatever. Island has a literal glass onion building on it. Eh, goofy, but I'll buy it. Miles is in possession of the real Mona Lisa, on loan from the French government. Well, that'd never fucking happen. But fine, I'm sure the French will surrender everything of theirs in due time. The billionaire can open and close the case of the Mona Lisa at the press of a button. And I'm out. Just make a straight comedy or a kid's movie if you want to do stuff as silly as this. Certainly don't make it the centerpiece of your film's climax. I get the movie's not taking itself totally 100% seriously, but it's also not Clue. Must be really great at Clue, huh? Oh, shut up. Clue, the movie, was a straight comedy, and I'd recommend it 10 times over this movie. Glass Onion is much, much less comically focused. It's an ensemble mystery drama with some loud, annoying comedic elements. What? and a Mona Lisa that'd be better treated in a national treasure movie. But hey, some silliness here and there doesn't preclude Glass Onion from being a fun, well-plotted murder mystery, right? Correct! And it does need to be well-plotted, TLJ fans. There are stories where it's fine to be all loosey-goosey on plot to focus on aesthetics, language, sound, themes, etc. But a whodunit? Not one of them. The whodunit formula is, by definition, a plot-driven puzzle. And as a puzzle, we, the audience, should be able to find all the pieces, usually left in plain sight, and put them together before the ending reveals the full picture. It's the writer's job to make that tricky for us, but not impossible. This is why Agatha Christie was the best-selling author of her time, and continues to hold that honor to this day. She nailed this formula, and it's just fun. Reading her stuff is like playing a game, but with a book. These things are great! It's like TV in your head! And as with most good games, they're usually pretty fair. If you miss something in one of her puzzles, well, that's generally on you. you. By contrast, when, not if, when you miss something in Glass Onion, it's because Rian keeps most of the puzzle pieces sealed in the box and stashes the box behind his back for the first hour and a half. So not only does he continuously fail to deliver believable scenarios, Rian fucks your insight into them with dishonest editing, nonstop contrivances, and outright nonsensical character behavior, all while burrowing everything beneath a near constant barrage a painful dialogue and pop culture humor that'll age worse than insert celebrity Botox monstrosity here. For an example of lazy dialogue and already dated humor, take the very first scene with our protagonist, Super Detective Benoit Blanc, in the bathtub, playing Among Us. World's greatest detective? I thought she'd be better at this. Come on, Rian, keep up with the times. Death Note did this shit 16 years ago. What is that? I know that shape. It looks familiar. Then Blanc speaks. I'm either going insane in my mind is a fueled up racing car and I got nowhere to drive it. Just full of that southern humility, ain't you, buddy? This is like some parody of that banal butter squash crumbleberry show. God! No. God! God! All that matters to me is the work. Without that, my brain rots. Okay, okay, maybe Blanc's been playing some Brain Age on the DS, so it's a matter of record that his brain moves at the pace of a race car. And it's not just Rian blatantly telling the audience his character is a super smart detective. Not in danger, the hunt, the challenge. You're trying to be as economic as possible in terms of the storytelling. Clearly not. We already have Blanc all sussed in the suds, transparently bored out of his mind, and Rian still has the character tell us he's a big brain boy and that he needs more than this. That's already been abundantly communicated through his actions and the visuals. You want economical? Scrap all this crappy monologuing. I need a great case. Well, that ain't happening! With all the time he spends on him, at least Rian shows us the intelligence level of the ensemble stock characters, although their average brain age could use a little more nitro in the tank. And maybe stands for something? Heh. <laughs>
Uh, anywhere at any time at all? Here in the dark black void. Okay, and it's for- Andy's puzzle solving scene got the one smile out of me. But this really should have been Blanc's scene. To show us he thinks outside the box, doesn't suffer fools, and gets to the heart of the matter. No bathtub, no humongous booty, just him smashing up this box and some goggles in a bathrobe. Alas, we just get race car. Good job! And COVID. Remember COVID? Weirdly though, at about 15 minutes in, the COVID element is just erased from the story when everyone's given some oral vax thing. And bada bing! What is that? Is that some kind of disinfectant or... You're good. Looks like the next Knives Out sequel will be Blanc investigating the mystery of the sudden deaths in this friend group. I hope he's up to the task. Double vaxxed, booster, flu shot. Major fracture. But really, what was the point of the COVID shit then? Brian, you had a built-in excuse for everyone to use socially acceptable disguises, i.e. masks. Why wouldn't you take advantage of that? This was really all for an Among Us reference? Fucking really? Uh, we have a special scene in it for fans of a certain game. I'd vote to throw Rian out the airlock, but he'd edit the scene so it doesn't work. Okay, rest of this video is pure spoilers. You got three seconds before I tell you who's the one. Three, two, billionaire. It's the billionaire. Just like the first Knives Out, the most obvious candidate with the most capability, motive, and screen time is the killer. Damn, really be throwing me some curveballs, Rian. <laughs> It's like a glass onion, get it? Wrapped in so many layers, yet you can see through them all. But in fact, the sinner is in plain sight. Except, not really. This is particularly egregious because the movie doesn't even start to be a murder mystery until an hour in. When's a murder mystery start? My man, patience. Patience. He means it. Don't be holding your breath because you'll die away before anyone does in this film. You don't even get that murder mystery game Miles planned out. You know, that oh so important plot point in all of Glass Onion's advertising. You will have to closely observe each other. If anyone can name the killer, that person wins our game. Turns out it was mostly an excuse to get everyone here on this island. Then it's played off as another BBC Sherlockian joke when Blanc effortlessly deconstructs the game before it has a chance to begin. Reminds me of another excuse to go to an island that was tossed for a cheap laugh. <laughs> the real murder mystery starts when Twitch Rogan bites it, or drinks it, and soon after Andy gets shot. An hour and some change wasted, but let the games finally begin. Except, yet again, not really. If you were eager to try and puzzle out this mystery on your own, like, I don't know, a whodunit maybe? Well, too fucking bad. Immediately after Andy's death, Rian dumps about 95% of all that pertinent info in one fell swoop. And as a result, the mystery is more than elementary, my dear Watson. Child's play. Well, here's what happened. Miles co-founded his tech company, Alpha Industries, with Andy, but Miles wanted to go even further with a new hydrogen-based superfuel he called Clear. Andy vehemently disagreed, and so ensued a big court battle for ownership of the company. Now, this really isn't how it works, but I think most can suspend their disbelief on this, so I'll let it go. In court, Miles had all their friends lie on the stand and say he was the one who wrote all of Alpha's founding ideas on a lost cocktail napkin, proving him to be the true founder. That's really not how this works at all but whatever, Hollywood shit. After Annie inevitably lost the court battle and her company, she just so happened to find that napkin again, and for some wacko reason, emailed the disruptor saying so, and only them. Do you have a death wish? Crazily enough, that email caused everyone to race to Andy's house. And even crazier, they were all in the area to arrive within an hour of each other. Imagine that. Miles got there first though, and well, you know. She was clever enough not to fear Miles. She didn't see the real threat miles not real race car brain of her huh you seem to be behaving in a reckless fashion despite dragging andy to her car ostensibly leaving prints everywhere and leaving no suicide note except for her fucking email still open on her computer showing exactly why she'd be killed that very day the movie acts like miles will never be caught by the popo for any of this the contents of that envelope and his possession of it were our only physical he even easily located the napkin, which wasn't put in a safe or anything, just left out in a big red envelope to steal. And he did. Jinkies, gonna need some kind of super detective to figure this one out, gang. Miles doesn't destroy the napkin, by the way, because he's canonically a retard. Miles Braun is an idiot. 
A few days later, the Disruptors, so far oblivious to Andy's death, each received a puzzle box from Miles with invitations to his murder party, something he had coincidentally set up far in advance of Andy's murder. It sure is strange how the Disruptors act like they haven't just seen each other at Andy's house in a total panic about the pending threat of perjury convictions. Ain't that something? That's because Rian is cheating the viewer's perception. He does it all over the place. Like how Andy too received the puzzle box. And I'm sorry, but there isn't a world where Miles invites her to this party. There just isn't. But Red the box could have been made so far in advance that it was before their court battle. Okay, but Miles still would have canceled the delivery. Maybe he was trying to cover for his hastily executed murder. That'd make him look far more sus, though. Hey, lady, who I've destroyed and estranged in a lengthy court battle, come to my murder party. Oh, wow, wait, she died? <laughs> Whoopsie doodle, my bad. Yeah, but he's retarded. You said so yourself. Mm, fine, I did say that. Remember, all this information I just gave you, you don't get any of it until about an hour and 30 30 minutes. The way Glass Onion's written, you can't have this information, because it'd blow the lid on the big dumb twist, which is that the Andy on the Island was, in reality, her much more alive secret twin sister, Helen, all along. My sister was Cassandra Brand. <sighs> <sighs> Well, the cheesy secret twin trope is a long-time cliché in mystery fiction. For all you Drew crew out there, it's even one of the worst endings to a her interactive game. Yahoo! But that's not a real problem here, it's more fundamental than that. It's just a terribly constructed twist. A truly effective twist is prepared with appropriate foreshadowing, so you get that aha, I was under my nose this whole time moment. That's the real meat of a twist, because the fun part is looking back and seeing how you were tricked. Well, looking back in Glass Onion, we were tricked, alright, as Rian just cheated some more. Distracting us with nothing! Yeah, Helen was there in front of you all along, you know, in the literal sense, but the movie's edited so there's never a good reason to suspect she's not who she says she is. Everything pointing to it is concealed by selective bits of missing scenes, cutaways, and Rian essentially lying to the viewer. <laughs> Sneaky. It's so well hidden, not even Miles suspects she's not Andy, when of everyone he probably should have some doubts. Wait a second! Yet he casually just lets her wander his island with unrestricted access to him and all of his stuff. What? Is that a spear gun? Chekhov's churning up snow in Moscow over this fucking crossbow going unused. A good twist is constructed a lot like a good murder mystery, really. The writer probably shouldn't lay out all the puzzle pieces in this case, but definitely throw out a few. Foster a general sense of something not being quite right, so the viewer should have the chance to catch the disruption before it's presented in full. Again, that's what makes it fun. It should always be there to figure out, but if the writer knows what the hell they're doing and can clearly really misdirect us, we, the viewers, likely get got. Regrettably, a lot like Rian's ability to write a murder mystery in the first place, it appears he hasn't the first idea of how to set up a plot twist either. There's no aha moment to this sister switcheroo. Aha! Rather, it's an, oh, okay, didn't see that coming. Aside from the fact nothing's really happened for over half the movie, so genre savvy watchers can guess something's up. I sense a disturbance in the transmission. But that ain't a gotcha, it's a plot blah. There's never any motive to suspect Andy was Helen until we're told so. Helen acts just like Andy would among her enemies, is presented as the outcast Andy would be among her enemies, leaves the after dinner party like Andy would because fuck, they're all her enemies. Who are you fooling, girl? And no one even acts like Andy is there to make good on her perjury threat, which could potentially trip Helen up if there was a protracted discussion among them. But nope, none of the disruptors seem all that curious about their old bar friend who just days ago threatened to throw them behind bars. Rian doesn't leave any adequate hints that Andy isn't Andy. Until he shows us, oh, she was dead this whole time. Great. Willing to bet he had a much more conventional first draft with that murder mystery game being more central or significant. But dang it, Ron. Nice, Ron. Probably he played an infamous piece of Japanese media between rewrites and was inspired to include a twist where a character is replaced by a twin at the start. It's just a terrible, terrible game. He just really didn't do it well. And you can't even have much fun with it because Rian's massive exposition dump leaves you with like two or three puzzle pieces left. Knowing Miles and Andy's backgrounds means there's a singular motive for killing Andy protecting Miles. They all had a motive to protect Miles. The individual reasons for the disruptors to hate Miles are suddenly swept off the game board now that we know the entire group is inextricably tied to him by committing perjury. If Miles goes down, they all go down. So either Miles is the killer to protect himself, or one of the disruptors did it to protect him. Way to go, Rian. Really worth it for the umpteenth use of this secret twin plot reversal. Well done. Helen wants revenge. She's convinced one of those shitheads. 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 Going to the island killed her sis. She just needs proof. So she hired Blanc, the world's greatest detective according to Google, which must also evidently give his address away, to go to the island and find it. 
Stop and think about this amazing plan of hers for a second, because Rian sure didn't. In Helen's viewpoint, how does going to the island connect to finding proof of Andy's murder in any way? Why would this proof be on the island instead of, oh, I don't know, in Andy's fucking house where the killer killed her? The only possible piece of evidence on Miles Island would have to be the envelope with the napkin he stole. And really, unless it's for prints or something, even the napkin doesn't prove much, if anything. Yet Helen's plan was to hope beyond all hope that the killer wouldn't have simply destroyed the envelope and its content, would bring it to this island. They brought it here. It's here. And just leave it lying around for a completely uninvited investigator to retrieve as evidence. It's a stupid idea, right? It's so dumb. An investigator renowned for being the best in his field, too. A private investigator of great renown. The kind of person to make a bunch of career criminals clam up and shut down. In the original Knives Out, everyone had to talk because they were being questioned by the police. And it's not super realistic the cops would let a privately hired detective mosey in on their scene, much less take it over like Blanc does. But again, suspension of disbelief. I can accept that as possible enough. I cannot accept Blanc bumbling his way onto a private island with a bunch of paranoid crooks to find the world's most enduring cocktail napkin. It makes no damn sense. I must confess I paid money to see this movie. Movie. That's on me, and I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me for my transgression. I am so sorry and ashamed of what I did. Blanc takes the plan even stupider. So much stupider. Suggesting Helen should go with him while pretending to be her sister so she can do the snooping. Snoop. I don't know Andy is dead, so why would they suspect anything? You don't know that. You can't know that. But I know the worst possible candidate for a Snoop mission like this Snoop. would be an exact lookalike of the woman who outed herself as their greatest enemy. I sure would keep my doors locked around my greatest enemy. Blanc even point blank admits this would be highly dangerous for her and he's no bodyguard. But oddly, here he acts as if only the killer would want her dead in this scenario. From the moment you arrive on that island, the killer will know who you are and what you are doing. And they wouldn't hesitate to kill again if it covers their tracks. Except toward the end, he changes his story to include everyone on the island. It's on a remote island filled with desperate people, all of whom have a real life reason to wish this woman harm. So Blanc intentionally brought Helen to an island in his world words filled with desperate people who would wish this woman harm. What the f Fuck. But it worked. Not only did Miles' security let Blanc on the island, they boated over Helen too, without looking for an invitation from them both, or else there'd be no story. The more, the merrier. Furthermore, Miles let them both stay on the island without a hint of pushback. The ghost of his murder victim and the world's greatest detective both obviously there to get him, and he was just cool with it. Thrilled to have you. I mean, Relax. Didn't get rid of the napkin either. Instead, within minutes of Blanc showing up, Miles gladly showed him where he was hiding it. I, I'm not. Are you insane? There's even this strange red herringish mechanic where Miles gives everyone a personalized biorhythm monitor wristband to act as the key to their room. Your biorhythm monitor is the key to your room. Your rooms are assigned by the chakra that I most closely associate with each of you. And it doesn't lead to anything when you really think it would. Like Helen would have to get all sneaky and steal people's wristbands while they're in the pool to search their rooms or something like that. But nah, it's just some throwaway detail. It does beg the question why Miles had one prepared for Blanc though. Seven friends, seven Seven monitors for the seven main chakras. Stay girl! Uh. But Blanc's the eighth arrival. Security must have had an extra on hand just in case, huh? On the subject of pulses, when Twitch Rogan is finally twitching on the carpet, we get Rian's greatest twist of all. The revelation that detective extraordinaire Benoit Blanc is, in fact, also canonically a retard. And my mind is so dumb. Sorry, that's offensive. I meant a retard. Blanc's race car brain speedily goes Blanc. He misses everything, and I mean everything, every gigantic neon flashing detail he can. Turns out Twitch Rogan had seen Miles racing away from Andy's place after the murder and tried to extort him over it when news of her suicide came up through a Google alert. So Miles handed Rogan a drink with something he's deathly allergic to, pineapple juice, and the dude's like, sweet, I trust you, bro. Down the hatch. Because no one noticed, Rogan drank out of Miles' glass, especially not Blockhead. Miles himself had to point it out and pretend he was scared someone there meant to target him instead. Worse, Rogan was the only guy there with a gun on him and a front fucking facing holster. And once again, the world's greatest detective directly facing said holster, who, remember, Sherlock the fuck out of that fake murder mystery game earlier, missed the missing gun. Forget about his phone, look. Where's his stupid gun? When did his gun disappear? Come on, man. This was precisely the point where my suspension of disbelief, already hanging by a thread, fell to its death and bled out on the ground floor. R.I.P. Bayleaf. The lights went out suddenly, something only Miles could control, and he used the confusion to shoot Helen with Rogan's gun he stole. But Helen survives by sheer fucking luck.
Come on, man. Motorhead over here nearly got these twin sisters finished off days apart from each other. I'd like to think that if I were him in this situation, I could have guessed. My guest, I brought here with a huge target painted on her back, might be in danger from the established gunman on the loose. Also, fairly optimistic, I wouldn't stand there and have a full-on conversation in the open under the only lights on the compound that are still functional for some reason. But hey, I'm built different. My brain age is a jet engine, baby. Well, it still took me a few watches to really grasp this, but there are a couple of big problems with all this billionaire on black violence. Let's start with the easy one. Miles kills Helen because he thinks she's Andy and he wants to finish the job. Finish it! Here's the age-old question. Why? From Miles' perspective, if Andy's alive and he isn't already in jail for attempted murder, well, golly gee, he just pulled off the perfect crime. He got the napkin, just as planned, and there's no other record of it existing beyond a picture of an envelope that proves nothing. Additionally, Miles somehow already got away with being at Andy's house and leaving his prints everywhere. So guess what? He's good. He did it. He won. I've won. He doesn't need Andy to be dead anymore. Really, it's better that she isn't, just in case the police ever did find something on him. He should be overjoyed she survived and that he got what he wanted from her. He definitely shouldn't try to kill her a second time. Now he's just asking for it. Ah, well, he is a retard. Kinda retarded. But that's just the first problem with this. The second one is even worse. Can you, viewer, guess what it is? Do you have what it takes to solve this puzzle? I'll give you a hint. It's very much tied to the reason Miles killed Rogan. Here, pause the video to try and think of why killing Helen makes no sense if Miles felt the need to kill Rogan. And pause now. Hey, you're back. I missed you. Okay, so the media finally got it out that Andy died, and Rogan knows Miles is the real culprit and shakes him down over it. Therefore, Miles kills Rogan to keep his secret safe. That being the case then, why the fuck does he steal Rogan's gun to kill Helen, as he knows she can't be Andy? He attempts to kill Andy's twin, uh, just because? Helen certainly doesn't know anything more than Andy would. She's far less of a threat than Andy ever could have been, and yet, bam, fuck that fake blonde bitch. Hell, if you're gonna shoot anybody here, shoot the super detective who's gonna nail you to the wall for Rogan, not the innocent lady who has nothing on you. It's almost like Rian didn't think any of this through. Hmm? Man, I sure wish a nice producer would give me millions of dollars to churn out quarter-baked garbage. Kanye. I'm not going to say what race, what people, we know I can't say that. Okay, finally, good, because that shouldn't matter. It was a Jewish- Kanye! With the wheels finally a-turning in his head, Blanc catches on from his series of near-fatal mistakes and he lays out what really happened to everyone as Helen furtively searches Miles' office. He makes his excuses too, saying the only reason he didn't figure this all out sooner was because- I expected complexity. I expected a puzzle. It hides not behind complexity, but behind mind-numbing obvious clarity. That's it. Subverting the tropes of the genre. Rian's trademark subversion. That the mystery was so fucking dumb, Blanc was too smart to see it. What? Forget Blanc, Noir, or Noel from Deathflix 2017 was a better detective than this leghorn talking fuck. Who's responsible for this unwarranted attack on my person? Seriously, Blanc doesn't even realize until right here that Helen's attempted murder was exactly the idea he gave to Miles earlier. Jackass! You stole the whole idea from me. Come on now, how the fuck is Miles the stupid one in this scenario? He borrowed an idea from what was supposed to be the most race car brained guy on the island, and it would have worked too if it wasn't for that meddling plot convenience. So dumb, it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb! This is so on the nose, I have to wonder, is it... Is the movie supposed to be bad? Ow! You did that on purpose. I'm almost not sure. No! Either this movie is some incredibly elitist genre deconstruction, or it just sucks. It's just dumb! You pick. It's up to you, is Nancy Drew. Well, before you do that, let me finish the summary. I'm let you finish. Thanks, yay, because the ending is a doozy. As luck would have it, the envelope remains hidden right out in the open for Helen to find. Still no safes in this universe. The script even remarks how stupid this is, since it's apparently the lone piece of evidence to nail Miles with. And after all that, you, you still kept the envelope. Stupid. So Helen waltzes up to Miles to show him her fine, right to his face, and he just uh, lights it on fire, destroying it. Up in smoke. This house of contrivances is stacked so high, it's almost impressive. Let's go step by step for this. One, Helen finds the long coveted McNapkin and tauntingly displays it to the guy who fucking shot her. Two, she does this because... Then you could cherish the look of surprise on my face. <laughs> 
three, she does this in a room full of morally bankrupt people who also think they need that McNapkin to disappear or they're fucked too. Desperate people wish this woman harm. Four, Helen must regularly assume Miles no longer has a loaded gun anymore or other weapons. Like a crossbow? Please, you set it up, use the crossbow. Five, Helen says her napkin will be considered the real one because of the signage on it. But no one questioned Miles' fake napkin without it as it's strongly implied no more glass onion bar napkins existed to verify against. Yet we have to assume this napkin suddenly can be verified. Six, Helen doesn't know how to social distance. You're violating my territorial bubble. Seven, race car brain over here just smirks like any of this is a good idea. Eight, instead of swiping the napkin out of her hand, Miles goes to the trouble of stealthily taking out a lighter, reaching for the napkin with it, and perfectly aligning the flame to set it on fire. Nine, Helen somehow doesn't notice any of Miles' movements or attempt to pull the napkin back. And ten, the napkin burns like it's been soaked in Blanc's brain juices. Gasoline. Good gravy, this fucking scene is more artificial than- Insert horrific Botox monstrosity here. Big deal, Red, it's just a napkin. Can't you suspend your disbelief for a napkin? I'll suspend you with a napkin, motherfucker. In a fit of rage over their only piece of supposed evidence going up, Helen starts burning the onion down, and Miles does nothing to stop her. In the midst of this, Helen pulls out some clear given her by Walter White, and while still inside the onion, she blows the thing like the Hindenburg. The Hindenburg? <laughs> Hey, a little bit of trivia for you. Did you know that Hindenburg was also an inside job? Now, you ain't gonna believe this, because you shouldn't, but everyone inside the glass onion? Those shitheads. They survived this explosion perfectly unscathed. Your disbelief, is it still sus? Guess who else survived the blast? That's right, dear Miss Mona. And what does our gallant hero Helen do? Saves her, right? It's the Mona Lisa for smiling out loud. Surely if he's going down, he's taking her with him. So Helen sprints across the flaming wreckage to open her case and purposefully fucking torches her. Just a cold and lonely heart. Talk about a truly effective twist, I could barely believe what I was seeing. Rian Sensei expertly subverted my expectations by having the hero intentionally destroy the Mona Lisa just to make the villain cry. An invaluable treasure of humanity, one of the pillars holding up the foundation of art itself. The world's most famous painting, you dumbass. Set on fire by a teacher from Alabama so she can get some of that sweet, sweet revenge. You think you popped me like a gangster? What a short-sighted, damnably evil act. It's fine to want revenge. Everybody likes revenge. But to take it out on the entire world? Does she hate teaching Da Vinci to her students that damn much? But the billionaires, they are evil. Cool it with Andy. Jewy. For Mark. Fuck, man, we get it. We've seen the same rich bitch villain 300 gazillion times already. It's always the same zany tech billionaire lately, too. <laughs> when are we going to get everyone's favorite Harry Potter goblin, Soros? Not now. Helen says the reason for burning the oil finery is so Miles gets his wish, that his name will forever be remembered in the same breath as the Mona Lisa. The same breath as the Mona Lisa. Oh, you got his ass, sweetheart. You rid the world of something irreplaceable and forever bonded it to your enemy so he'll go down in history. I'm sure that's what Andy would have wanted. Well, maybe she'll get it too. Fingerprints don't burn as easy as one might think. So in reality, Helen should be implicated in Mona's destruction. So she too can have her and her family's name dragged through the mud until the end of time. What? Brian really saw this Reddit post, thought it should be a movie, and didn't even do it right. an awful, irredeemable ending to the clunkiest, worst-structured whodunit plot I think I've ever seen. I really don't have much nice to say about it, other than, I guess the acting was fine from everyone, kind of? What is reality?! And it looked okay, with a distracting reliance on close-ups, but whatever, I wasn't really paying attention to that stuff. I was too preoccupied trying to figure out what the fuck was happening, only to realize... It's just dumb! Yep, that about sums it up, Ryan. Thanks for that. Feel free to disagree with me and the writer-director of this movie, if you wish. I just really felt the need to vent. Now, back to a real whodunit. Hugh killed my precious twin, ER. You did this. You ain't got jack on me, man. It was you, Red. You in the white room with a pair of scissors. You think so, huh? And where's your proof? Say it's about a four out of ten. Mmm, I probably shouldn't have done that on video.
Uh oh, sounds like Deathcon 3. Ship's gonna blow like the Hindenburg. The Hindenburg? And it looks like Yay ran off to play a different voting game, so. Oh, did it, did it, did it. <laughs> I've won. You're ruining this for me. Surprise, motherfucker. How'd you get back inside? Did you pop in? Forcibly? Nah, nah, I was Black Secret Twin all along. Oh. Hey, are you allowed to say that? What, Naga? Yeah, I can say it. I'm hot egg. <laughs> See? Hmm, fair enough. I thought only Hack Browns could say it. Naga! Nevertheless, omelets. When will they burn? Don't you dare, Naga. You want to get to me? You have to go to Mona, Lisa, and... Looks like I gotcha this game.